That's not what he said. That's not what he said. Getting accurate information from scripture is so important because if not, you can mislead people. It can actually lead people to a crisis of faith. Misleading people can cause people to not have an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're going to quote the scripture, make sure you get it right. We all have heard things that were said to be in the Bible, and we end up reciting oral statements shared to us. The danger of some of these statements reinforce a system of beliefs. These system of beliefs become building blocks of how we view God, faith, and how we live it out. During this series, we will peruse several statements and try to reframe, with the Lord's help, the proper knowledge or interpretation. There are some statements that are very detrimental that you have heard that will really radically hurt your faith, such as, God will not give you more than you can bear. You hear that at funerals, you hear that when tragedy happens, and the reality is, that is not in the Scripture. There are seasons and moments where it does feel like, and it is true, that you have more than you can bear. We have heard things such as, God helps those who help themselves. Although portions of that may be true, it's not biblical. Only God can judge me. That's what Tupac's saying, and then everybody adopted it as a Bible verse. <laughs> My favorite that I hate in church. The Bible says when praises go up. I don't know about that. I've seen praises go up and my car break down right when I left church. <laughs> there are worship leaders that use this phrase all the time as if it's a verse. The Bible says, hallelujah is the highest praise. Where did y'all find that? Where did y'all get that at? That's, that's, no, no, no. Cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> This morning, I'm going to start to come for your edges, so be safe. And brothers, I'm coming in the hole like LeBron on the Miami Heat to help us reflect the image of God and the Imago Day, which simply means the image of God, that we all aspire to be like. I want to talk in this intro about shacking and the Sabbath. On a very controversial show called Preachers of L.A., which I would never be on, was a contentious argument with Dietrich Haddon about the term shacking. We must realize we have a generation, this is very important, we have a generation who reads the Bible not from the lens of edification, but from the lens of exemption. So when you hear the word shacking, you may say, well, what is that? Is that a house? The old saints would say, you, you can't shack because the Bible says that. And what they were referencing was two couples cohabitating together, a male and a female. And as people begin to become more red and more scholastic or YouTube scholar, they begin to say, the Bible is not true because the Bible never said you can't shack. Find me the scripture. And then, you know, the older saints would try to look for it and they couldn't find it. And they were like, man, it's somewhere in there. Maybe it's in the King James Version. And they look in the King James Version, can't find it. Then they go to NIV and can't find it. Well, here's the, here's, the, here's the truth. There is no such thing as shacking in scripture. Now, living together with somebody According to scripture, there's, there's nothing that says that shacking is in scripture. So I know, I get it. Now you're like, boom, babe, I've been telling you. That's why I go to kingdom. That dude real, bro. That four weeks he took off, he need to take more time off. Because shacking is not in scripture. But remember, the Bible was not written to America. 
because the, what would happen is, is that if you wanted to date my daughter, you had to come to the father, the family unit, and the father had to give you permission to date his daughter. And it wasn't even dating, it was to marry his daughter because there was no auditioning. The father confirmed whether you were good or not for the daughter without y'all going on a first date. And what the father would then do is, after you all go on your wedding that the father would pay for, he would wait for the honeymoon, this is in the Old Testament, he would wait for you all to have um, relations. And if there was no blood on the sheets, because she was supposed to be a virgin, you would be killed. This is why when Mary got pregnant, it was a big deal because she was going to be killed because there was no such type of thing of like, just live your life. So I know some of you are like, well, pastor, I'm just PD, I'm PDSJ. I'm just trying to save some money and we're just trying to live together. First Thessalonians 5 says this, it's one verse, but it's in a context of a whole different verses. It's like Paul's giving a whole bunch of thoughts to the church of Thessalonica. And he's like, um, yeah, you got to abstain from the very appearance of evil. So if you feel that you can live in a house with a partner you're not married with, and Jesus even moves the needle even further. He says, well, no, because some of y'all will say, well, we ain't sleeping together. Jesus said, but if you think it in your heart. So you mean to tell me she can come out the shower? And you see her glistening. And you just going to walk by and say, nope, I'm saving myself until we're married, buddy. If, if you could see his shoulders coming out and you, you are, if you could stand before God and be okay telling God in his face that we are not going to engage. Now, that's a question that your conscience has to answer. And then there's the deeper question is, does your witness matter? So, so would I be able to present Christ effectively? to others by telling them that this is bad. He live in the bedroom down the hall. We live together. We just pray together. That's all we do. Come on, church. Y'all don't want to be real this morning. Valentine's Day coming around and y'all in the same house. We just going to watch a movie together and we just going to snuggle together. And that snuggle going to turn into a lot more than snuggling. Because scripture is clear. If you violate these laws, you're in sin. Now, the question is, is if you die shacking, what will be your response to the God that you were supposed to be submitted to? Here's a question I want to ask you. Can you trust God that he can provide for you fiscally, then you cut in corners to get it done? I know I lost about a few members. But the reality of the matter is shacking, because the word doesn't say it exactly, doesn't mean that you can't parallel throughout scripture that that's not probably a productive way to live your life in faith. I don't, I don't, I don't do that. The Bible don't talk about praise and worship. God ain't into all that. There weren't no praise and worship in church. Yeah, we noticed that, but there was praise and worship in scripture. We can make the Bible fit whatever way we want to fit it because we don't want to do the right thing by it. The proper order of God, and there are statistics that have been shown that people who live together before they get married do not make them have a more successful marriage. Pastor, I got to test drive it before I buy it. You do know you lessen the value of a car when you drive it before you buy it. Okay, y'all can't get no help in the church today. All right. So I want, I want you to be clear on that matter, because it does matter. Pastor, we just going to buy a house together before we get married. How y'all know y'all going to make it? I have seen couples buy a house before they got married and not make it. That's why, okay, I'm not a cook, so don't judge me. 
But I do know that if you skip ingredients in food cooking, it won't taste right. And it's the same thing when you skip the order of that. Come on, y'all. Can we be real for a second? I know y'all what y'all do. Y'all, y'all can't wait. So y'all go to the courthouse. Y'all get married early. Y'all do y'all thing. And then y'all come to church and act like, you know, this is the first time y'all got married. Y'all been married a year. Ain't nobody know. You ain't even invite your mom or daddy. Couldn't stop. You know, it's just, uh, I got it. But because people feel that I'd rather marry than burn, they rush the process. And when you rush the process, sometimes you marry your appetite. So that's why God had order set. He had fathers there so that you could bring your spouse, potential spouse to, so your father. Now, Western world is different. We date all that in the old day. You used to go to the father and ask the father for the daughter's hand. Ain't no fathers in the home. So daughters are guessing if this is the right one. Because daddy will tell you, I don't care how much you love him, he's a dog, don't you, don't you do it. Daddy is a protector that he won't go too far because he know daddy going to be right around that corner. But that's why the family structure is so important. But here's the next one. Let's go to the second one. <laughs> the Sabbath. You ever get in a fight with the seven-day Adventists? Y'all ain't worshiping God right on Saturday. Now, let's begin by doing a real exploration of Scripture. On the first day, God created these things, the heavens and the earth. On the second day, he created the next phase, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. And then on the seventh day, he rested. Saturday was the day that God chose to be the day that he rested on. So as churches evolved... They took Saturday as the day of holy day. In the Old Testament, Saturday was the Sabbath day. Now, you do know there are Ten Commandments. These Ten Commandments are in Exodus chapter number 20. Write the note. It says this. But trust me, if you follow me by the end of this message, you're going to be really blessed by understanding the Sabbath. Exodus 20 verse 8 says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall work and do all thy work. But in the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no work, nor thy son, nor daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger is within the gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the seas, and them that is in it rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You ever wonder why, it's not in the Bible, I can't prove this, but you ever wonder why Sunday naps be so anointed? They just feel so good. Like, Monday naps don't even compare. Saturday naps don't even compare. The Lord blessed the day that he chose to be holy. Now, the church consistently, Old Testament church, consistently worshiped on Saturday. That was the day that they paused and they rested. Now, when the New Testament happened, Jesus dies. On the first day, he, re uh, he resurrects from the grave. And then the church decided, you know what? Let's worship God on Sunday because that's the day that he resurrected. We want that to be the day that we can go to the church and show our love for our Savior. Now, the seven-day week is found in cultures around the world, presumably because of the association with the sun, moon, and the five planets that are visible to the naked eye. Hence, the English Sunday, Monday is moon day, French, lundi, Saturday, Saturn day, French, mardi, Mars day, mercredi, which is Mercury day. It is fundamental to the creation in the Old Testament. Again, relating to order, time to the very essence. Now, what God says this in Colossians chapter number, 
Colossians chapter number two, go there. I need you to go there because that's going to help frame our conversation. So now, the New Testament church, they're worshiping on Sunday. Everybody's all, we come to church on Sunday. That's the day that we have sanctified to give to God. Because tithing is like the Sabbath. We already received the tithe, so I'm not trying to get another one from you. Tithing simply says, God, I'm going to give you 10% and I'm going to keep 90. I'm going to trust that if I give you a portion of it, you'll take care of all of it. So God gives us a principle. If you work six days, rest in me on the seventh, trusting that I can do more in your six than you could do working in your seven. Now, why would God give us a seventh day? Because he knew that we needed to work six days. And if you work seven days and don't rest, your body, number one, naturally will just shut down. Number two, your spiritual life will decline because you need to have one day that reminds you that the six days are for working, but one day belongs to God. And even though I have six days working in my own strength, if I don't give God this one day, those six days could be canceled. Now, the New Testament church, they begin to worship on Sunday because Jesus resurrected. So, to the SDA friends, we're not arguing about, is that a salvation matter? But here's where you want to go. Colossians chapter number two. This is where Paul is talking about the sufficiency of Christ. He's telling us that Christ is enough. So, a lot of the things that we would do in the Old Testament were shadows to prepare us for Jesus. Right? So you couldn't bring an offering without spot or wrinkle. Why? Because it was preparing us for the Holy Lamb of God that would come without spot or wrinkle. You would see Jesus show up in theophanies like the burning bush where, where you would see God showing up in different spaces and places. You would see Abraham about to sacrifice his son and he's sacrificing a 27 to 30 year old Isaac going up the mountain and all of a sudden God would say, no, you don't got to do that. I got a ram in the bush from, from slain from the very foundation of the world. All those things were preparing us for this Messiah that was coming. So now Paul, who's an apostle in the church, He's given the authority to teach the church how to live properly. He says, a lot of the things that y'all were doing, y'all were just doing it to remind you that Jesus is coming. He's already here. So now here's what he says. So, so you know, like people are like, bro, you shouldn't be eating shrimp because Exodus says you shouldn't eat shrimp and Leviticus says you shouldn't eat shrimp and all this type of stuff. There were Levitical laws for different types of people. There were laws just for the priests. You can't cut your hair. You can't have tattoos. That's a whole different thing. Some of you, that's a whole different piece. Because Jesus comes back riding on a, riding in the cloud in Revelation with a tattoo on his thigh. You do know your body's going into decay. I'm not endorsing that you go out and tat yourself up. I'm just simply saying don't worship this temple because it's nothing to be worshipped. You got to help me out? Okay. Anyway. Uh, anyway, y'all. Jesus got a tattoo. You got to argue with Jesus. All right. Let me say, um, verse number 14 blotting out handwritings that wore against us, which were contrary and took it the way to nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities, powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Here's verse 16. Church of Colossians, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect to a holy day or new moons or the Sabbath day, which are shadows of Christ to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you in regards to voluntary humility and worshiping angels, all this intruding to those things which he have not seen. So what Paul is trying to level the playing ground is saying, there's no one day that you hollow more than another, but we all should have one day that we hollow. So what that means is every single person should have one day that they decide this is my Sabbath and I'm not working. Yours may be Sunday. For those that are online that are catching this later, you may work and say, man, Sunday's not my Sabbath, but Monday's my day where I spend time with the Lord. I watch the Word of God. I study the Word of God. And the Sabbath was created according to Josephus and all the historians. It was a day that you rested from work. And you engage in family because the reason the family unit is important is why God gave us the Sabbath so you guys wouldn't lose connection because you're so busy working. 
I can't get no help in the church. So he says, this is what I'm going to do. If you honor the Sabbath, I'm going to bless that day and make it holy. So there's some, so while others are sleeping or going to get their mimoso and breakfast because they don't honor the Sabbath and they don't want to honor God, God says, you're going to be more blessed because you've given me a day that you acknowledge me. Proverbs says it like this, if you acknowledge me, I will, first you must acknowledge him, acknowledge him. What we're doing is we're starting our week as a tithe to God. To say, God, I would give you every day, but I can't. But I'm going to give you the first part of my week and offer it as a sacrifice to you to say, Lord, this is my day to commune with you. And the Lord says this, number one, when you honor the Sabbath, he will give you, number one, he'll give you rest. Because if you consistently work and don't stop working, you will never rest in God. You need to take a day and say, God, this is your day. I'm trusting you're going to make it work. But bro, I could go out and get that money. And God's like, how much money are you going to pursue and lose your family and not connect with them? I gave you a Sabbath because I knew it was going to protect you as a man. Mankind, not just man. The Sabbath is designed to give me rest. Somebody say, give me rest. Number two, the Sabbath is there to restore. There's a lot of things that we lost during the week that the Sabbath is there to restore. You know how we prayed and we felt now that we got faith. It was there to restore your faith because a lot of us were watching the news. A lot of us were watching the media and we are losing our faith. And God says, and you give me your Sabbath, I'm going to bless it and I'm going to restore things into your soul. On the seventh day, he rested. Some of you work seven days because you don't trust God can bless you in six. And if the truth of the matter is, most of us have made working our idol. He says, every person needs follow the principles of God. I work, I'm God, and I work six days and then decided one day I'm going to take a break. Listen, if you don't break, you will eventually break. Let me say it one more time. If you don't break, you will eventually break. Now, God is not against you working. He says, six days, go get it. But give me one. You got 100%, give me 10. I'm not going to ask for everything you got, but I want you to always have a system in your belief that says, every day I live, I'm going to give a portion to God. That's why when we start our day, we start our day giving it to God as a tithe to say, Lord, I'm going to work. But before I go to work, I'm going to give you the first part of my day. Before I go take a shower and do all those other things, I'm going to sacrifice the first part of my day and offer it as an offering to you because I don't know what's going to happen out there. But I know if I give you my first part of my day, even if hell comes on the job, I've been prepared for it spiritually and it will help me naturally. And that's why many of us us are missing it because we're spending all of our days trying to be a God to ourselves. Number three, the word is commonly understood to mean separated. The Sabbath is, 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 is mean holy, but it's also meant separated. It's in the sense of, of, of a, from breaking free from the usual denoting a special spiritual or quality of, of, of touching the divine. And some would say, well, in Leviticus 9, in, 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 in Colossians, he used the word Sabbath, which is plural. But here's the thing, in the Greek, the word Sabbath could be singular or plural. So just because he says Sabbath doesn't mean he's canceling out the day. The word in the Greek could be singular or plural. So when we read it, that's why sometimes we miss it. Here's the other thing. Sabbath brings serenity to the soul. If you want peace, you need a day where you give it to God. What you doing today? I worship. I'm going to enjoy the peace of God in this day. I'm going to play with my kids. I'm going to play with my spouse. I'm going to, if I'm single, I'm going to just enjoy. I'm not working. I'm not trying to build my brand because some of your brands are bigger than you. God's trying to make you in while you rest, God is doing what you cannot do. 
Sabbath means, A.J. Herschel says, the Sabbath means a sanctification of time. This is our Sabbath worship. We come together to worship God as a Sabbath, a sanctification of time. Number, number three, or four or five, whatever. The Sabbath is meant to reset. How many of you have went six days and didn't pray? Raise your hand, we all have. Don't lie in church. The Sabbath is to reset you, to let you know, listen, you've been out of whack. You need to get back on track. That's why worship is important because we hear God's word and God's word challenges us. Man, I've been slipping. Man, this pandemic made me stop going to church. Man, I don't remember the last time I opened my Bible. I don't remember the last time. And, and, and church should convict you because if we feed you Skittles every day, you won't grow. So I want you to feel a little uncomfortable if you shack, and it doesn't mean you need to leave coming to church because it don't feel good. Because sometimes when you work out and don't feel good, that means you're growing. Here's the thing. It causes you to reset. Some of us need to reset. Like, God, I need to, I need to, get, I need to get right with you. All the stuff that's going on in the world, I need to reset. Like y'all saw the judge that died. Her body didn't even hit the ground. This is just, the principle is not a political thing. The principle is this. The world will keep going even if you're gone. So don't give your whole body and life to an organization and then all of a sudden the organization move on without you and you could have stewarded your body better. Lastly, the Sabbath was always meant to replenish. The Sabbath was always meant to replenish. Take the time or make time to honor the Sabbath. Sabbaths are shadows of things to come because there will be a future coming where we will be at rest forever. This is a microcosm of what we're going to experience. We're going to be worshiping the Lamb of God in eternity. Here it is, and I'm done. Paul is trying to emphasize Colossians 2, 15 through 17. Once one finds Christ, he no longer needs the old shadow because you have the real thing. All of my big ballers, shock collars, dipping in the bends with the spoilers. That's a rap song. That's not scripture. Oh man, I got, I got, I got to grind. I got to grind. And God's like, but where's my Sabbath? I've given you six days. So I've given you 168 hours a week and you can't find eight hours for me. There's a very important principle that this culture doesn't realize. It's the principle of idolatry. Okay? So, so, so let me give you this quote because I, I want you to write it down because it, it will help you. It will help you. It says this. What you can't rest from, you are a slave to. What you can't rest from, you're a slave to. You need to take time to rest. It doesn't mean that we got to go on vacation, but just take the time to let your body restore itself. Some of us are dying and getting sick and COVID is hitting our community because one, we, we are, we're, our eating is bad, but two, we don't rest. We're so busy trying to chase an American dream that every time you get to the, every time you think you're getting closer, the dream moves further back. We got to learn how to rest because you won't win without God and when we put you in the box when I do funerals this is how it goes they cry when you're at the at the altar when they get to the grave they've already moved on they're joking they're having a good time 
at my funeral, if anybody is joking at the graveside, run them over. <laughs> they ain't even in the ground yet. They're like, hey man, what you got going on later? What you got? No, because life moves on. Here's what I'm saying. You need to learn to rest. Oh man, I just got to get the overtime. Let me ask you a question. Can you trust that God can stretch what you have in six days and trying to get everything in seven? Well, Pastor, you don't understand. You know, you, you, just, you just ain't part of our lives. I understand. I understand. There's so much money to be made. There's so Money will always be there. But you'll lose a lot of things trying to chase after something that will never chase you. So today I have some application questions. Next week we're going to deal with this whole idea God will not give you more than you can bear because it's a lie. Some of you are bearing a whole lot of stuff and you keep getting mad at God because you're saying, God, I thought you said, and God's like, I didn't tell you that. And some of the stuff that we're carrying God never gave us, we decide to carry it ourselves. So here are some application questions I want you to take a picture of if you need to because I think it's going to be helpful for you. Number one, because we got to do church a little differently. Number one is what... What did you learn today about shacking and Sabbath that you didn't know before? Some of you are like, man, I'm about to put my man out today. Well, listen, <laughs> got to figure things out first. Don't have him inboxing me. Oh, you the man that told him to put me out? <laughs> Before you inbox me, I have a 40 and a 9. They're both my friends. Amen. Praise God. Let me say. All right, so the next number two is this. What adjustments will you make? What adjustments will you attempt to make to honor your Sabbath? Some of you constantly looking at your email. Uh, number three, what was your understanding of shacking and Sabbath prior? How will you use this message this week? I pray that you receive something from the Word of God. I pray that we'll all honor the Sabbath. One thing I must commend my SDA friends about is that they respect the Sabbath. And I'm not saying this to be, I don't know if it's true as a statistic, but most SDA people that I've met are doing very well in their personal lives. That's not general because they honor the Sabbath. They trust that God will provide. God doesn't want you to honor the Sabbath and be legalistic. You see someone die and you're like, well, can't help you. It's my Sabbath. It ain't supposed to work. <laughs> no, that's what they were doing with Jesus. They were mad because he was healing on the Sabbath. They were more, they worshiped the day more than they did the principle of why they worshiped it. And so today, every one of us is not exempt from having a Sabbath. And as we take Holy Communion, those of you that are online, grab something that symbolizes it, whether it's crackers, whether it's grape juice, whether it's wine. <laughs> Some of you are like, praise God, I need to go home. Because you do understand, the Bible matters because people, people will tell you this, like, communion was done with wine, it wasn't done with grape juice. And the reason why we don't do wine today is because some people have taste of alcohol and you want to give them that taste back. I'm not endorsing alcoholism. I'm just telling you what the Bible did. The Passover cup was a cup of wine. And why we do this? To remind ourselves and reset our minds to let us know our king is not elected November 3rd. Our king reigns on our hearts. And listen, it does matter who's, people say it doesn't matter who's in the White House, all that matters is who's in my, no, it does matter who's in the White House. But what matters more is that God is in my house. So as we take communion, y'all that are online watching, stop feeling bad for the shadows. You've been forgiven. You've been redeemed. Trust in him. Let yourself not be discouraged and know that God died just for this moment to remind you that no weapon formed against you shall ever prosper.